it from well, different angles and from different empirical viewpoints. Um, the first speaker is Jakob Svensson from um, the University of Stockholm, who will speak on um, uh, getting prices right, the impact of market information services in Uganda. Please, Jakob. Well, uh, and you have about 20 minutes for your presentation. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, or a little more, perhaps. Okay. 20, say 20, 27. 27, okay. Oh, thanks very much, uh, and um, thanks for inviting me here to present <clears throat> some, very, some very preliminary and, and ongoing work, including the title, as you see. It um, has changed, and it will probably change a few more times before we uh, write this up in a, in a, in a paper. So, uh, um, let's see. Is it not more? Have you put it on full page? Can we just push F5? F5? I think so. You full screen? Full, full screen, screen mode, right? Oh, cool. There you go. Okay. So, so, um, uh, so, so one of the fundamental results in, in economic theory is that in, 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 perfect, in perfect markets where uh, price-taking producers and consumers uh, can trade goods at, at known prices, uh, the allocations of goods is, uh, is, is inefficient. So this might be a, a good starting point, a good approximation for how uh, some market works, uh, but uh, it's not a good approximation for, for all markets. And in particular, I think uh, the underlying assumption stands in, in short contrast uh, to the reality faced by one of the main economic agents in, in, in developing countries, small-scale uh, uh, rural farmers. Uh, so if you look at uh, uh, the rural farmer situation, uh, it's often more uh, a better approximation of, of reality is probably that prices are not very well known. Uh, most uh, small-scale farmers do not have access to updated information on, on market prices due to information and, and, and poor information and, and communication infrastructure, among other things. And especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, for uh, small uh, uh, rural farmers, uh, they typically do not sell directly to the market. Uh, instead, they sell through a, a middleman or a trader. And in many cases, these traders act as, uh, as basically local uh, monopolists. So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, a study we are doing now and uh, using data from Uganda. And in Uganda, we, we see that uh, approximately three uh, quarters or 75% of the farmers sell uh, their crops to, to private traders. And only like four or 5% of the farmers uh, appears to sell directly to, to, uh, to the market. So the underlying assumptions here, or the, the market structure you uh, one want to look at, is uh, probably more a, a, a bargaining setup, where uh, 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 the farmer and the trader tries to bargain about the, the prices um, that the farmer receives for its, uh, uh, its crops, and, and how much, to, uh, how much to, to sell. And typically in this bargaining setup, uh, it seems uh, appropriate to assume that the farmer, uh, or the trader rather, is relatively more informed about the, uh, the market price than the, than, the, than the seller, the farmer. So we have a bargaining set situation with, uh, with incomplete information, and that's the type of, of underlying assumption uh, uh, about how the, how, how the market functions, I think it's, it, it's more uh, appropriate. So if you uh, solve that kind of a model, uh, a model of, uh, of bargaining under incomplete information, uh, this is a, is a rather standard, standard model in, in contract theory, uh, uh, that will uh, give uh, rise to uh, potentially important uh, contract uh, uh, frictions. And this is due to the fact that 
profit maximizing uh, traders will have an incentive to, to claim that the prices are, are much lower than they, they really are uh, in order to extract more rents from the, uh, from the farmer. And the farmer will respond to this basically by cutting down uh, uh, the amount of, of, uh, uh, of crops it, 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 um, it, uh, it will sell. So the theory that highlights that this problem of uh, asymmetric information can lead to uh, market failures with uh, too low levels of economic exchange uh, and, uh, uh, and also redistributive uh, uh, implications in the sense that the farmers will receive less than it would if it had full information about uh, uh, market prices. So guided by, these, uh, by such a model, this paper asks us questions about whether increasing farmers' access to price information can reduce these frictions and improve the functioning of, of, uh, of uh, agricultural uh, markets. So uh, why, is this, um, why is this important? Well, it's a well-established fact that uh, agricultural growth has a special powers in, in reducing, uh, reducing poverty. And I have a picture here. Uh, it doesn't uh, come out very well. Sorry, sorry for that. But it's, um, it's, it's a, a picture taken from uh, the 2008 uh, World Development Report. And as you see, there are two uh, 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 curves here. These curves uh, represent uh, uh, the impact of uh, GDP growth originating from agriculture and the non-agricultural sector. And on the uh, x-axis, you have, um, uh, you have uh, households ordered uh, according to uh, expenditure uh, uh, deciles. So for in particular, the poorer households, growth coming from, uh, from um, organizing from agriculture is, is much more important. And that's not particularly uh, surprising, given that sales of crop is the main source of cash income for many farmers in, in, in poor countries. Second fact uh, uh, that surprised me a little bit is that uh, when you look at household data, uh, it appears that small-scale farmers in particular tend to sell only uh, small shares of the crops, in, in, uh, uh, small shares of, of, uh, of uh, what they produce. Again, I have a picture here from, from four countries, Nigeria, Uganda, Malawi, and Ghana, and where you see that the shares sold out of that produce is... Uh, Overing around 20% in, in, in uh, two out of these countries is actually lower than 20%. So only roughly one-fifth of what you produce uh, do these farmers uh, 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 sell. So, of course, this result in itself doesn't necessarily mean that there are uh, market imperfections. It can, it can be optimal to, to uh, uh, just sell uh, small amounts. But this is something we will uh, investigate. In, in this, this is something we try to investigate in the paper. It's also interesting, from, uh, I think it's also an interesting issue from a policy point of view, because the question of uh, how to boast agricultural production, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, has been, an, uh, has been a big question in policy circles for quite some years. And the uh, underlying reason for this is, of course, this yield gap uh, that has been uh, increasing over time between sub-Saharan Africa and and other regions. And again, this graph you know, doesn't look very well, but the, uh, the green, the bottom green curve here is yields uh, per hectare, I think, uh, for sub-Saharan Africa. And these other uh, graphs are for other regions, South Asia, Latin America, East Asia, and developed countries in, in order. So uh, up to recently, the policies uh, people have been talking about mainly deals with, uh, mainly uh, 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 is about two things. Uh, one has to do with uh, deregulation of markets, and one has to do with um, uh, technology, technology, technology diffusion. But there are some problems here, if you look at the, the most recent evidence. First of all, it's uh, it's, it's, it's unclear if farmers in general are actually upgrading their technology. And the reason why is something I'm not going to talk, uh, uh, talk about here. And then there is a, a somewhat surprising results that uh, there is the, the supply response from these um, 
deregulations of the of the agricultural sectors has been uh, fairly low in in in, uh, in many countries. And again, I have a picture here. This is we can focus on the last two, uh, the bottom two graphs from uh, Uganda and Tanzania. These are yield again, cereal yields, and the reforms, the liberalizing of, of um, the uh, uh, agricultural markets in in Tanzania and Uganda happened sometime uh, around the early the early 1990s. And just looking at the mean outcomes here, it doesn't look like there has been a, a, a huge boom in in agricultural uh, production. Uh, let's, uh, let's skip that. So what we're going to do with this paper, what we do in this paper then, is to study a, a, a natural experiment, uh, the so-called Food Net Market Information Service project in, in Uganda. Uh, and the uh, Food, Net Info, Food Net Market Information Service project was a project that started in, in 2001 and uh, over a couple of years uh, was scaled up. And what they did was they collected uh, weekly data on prices for the main agricultural commodities in major market centers uh, across uh, Uganda. And then disseminated this information through local FM radio stations in uh, uh, 20 or 21, I think it was, maybe it was 21, out of 56 districts in, 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 uh, in Uganda. And the presumption was that this provision of information would uh, enable uh, uh, farmers to improve their bargaining position versus vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, the local uh, traders. So what we do is uh, we use two uh, uh, rounds of uh, household surveys, a household survey uh, uh, with data from 1999 and a household survey with data from, from uh, 2004. So data before the project started and data a, a few, uh, a year or two after it was uh, uh, scaled up. And then we're going to study the effects of uh, uh, access to information on, on, three, uh, on, three, uh, on, on three variables. So the likelihood that the farmer is selling his crop for the extensive margin, the total margin, that is the, the amount of, uh, of uh, uh, crops sold out of total production, and the prices received for, uh, for the crops the farmer is selling. Obviously, we face uh, uh, difficult identification issues here. So to estimate the causal effects here, we're going to employ a, a difference and difference estimations in, in three different dimensions. So we're going to look at uh, uh, variation of studying the effect of households with and without access to radio uh, across space, that is between districts where the food net project were uh, disseminating uh, information about market information and market prices uh, versus districts where the Food Net Project was not disseminating information. And we're going to also be able to look at uh, the results over time, that is, compare the difference between uh, uh, households with and without access to a radio over time, that is, before the project was started and after the project had been uh, initiated. And then we can also look at difference and differences across crops because the Food Net um, project collected information on only about 20 crops uh, out, of, uh, uh, many, uh, out of many crops that are produced uh, in, in, in Uganda. So we have some treatment crops and some controlled crops. So then we can compare within the household, basically, what happens to uh, the amount uh, of crops you're selling and the prices you, you uh, uh, are receiving. So uh, how much time do I have left? Um, 10, 12, 12 okay, fine. minutes. Fine. Uh, so, so let me just say a few words then about the, the Food Net project. Uh, it was initiated in 2001, and in, uh, by 2004, uh, the service then collected market data for around 20 agricultural commodities from around 20 market centers across the country on a weekly basis. And this information was then disseminated uh, through various radio stations and also through email and, and SMS, actually, but so, that's something we're not going to be uh, exploiting here, in around 20 districts. And although there is some variation across districts, typically in each week what was broadcast it was a 15-minute program plus a two-minute uh, 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 news bulletin uh, every day about uh, the current market uh, uh, situation. 
And that was broadcasted through FM radios in, in eight local languages. And as I said before, the main focus with this Fonet project was to uh, update farmers about the local uh, or district market uh, uh, conditions. In 2004, Foodnet themselves estimated that their market information service reached uh, around 7 million people uh, uh, each, uh, each week. So this is a picture of, uh, uh, of uh, Uganda and the darker colored district then is the Foodnet districts and, uh, uh, and the green colored ones are uh, districts where the project were not uh, uh, implemented in. And this is just to show that uh, access to information may be very important because there is a huge variation in, in, in market prices. So these are weekly prices from July 2004 to June 2005. So this is information collected by, by uh, the Foodnet project in one particular market, the Caseasa district market. So over time, we see uh, that uh, there's huge variation in, 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 in prices. So knowing the current market price uh, uh, ought to be uh, really important when you bargain with the, with a trader. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, there is also a lot of vari variation across district markets. Although I don't have a, 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 a picture of this. So we have two rounds of, of household survey data, uh, and we're going to look at. Uh, I'm going to mainly talk about these foodnet crops. Uh, these were the main crops uh, for which uh, foodnet uh, reported. Uh, uh, weekly information about market prices, maize, beans, groundnuts, cassava, millet, and sweet potatoes, uh, and all the other crops for which the food net did not include in the program are, are, are going to be the control crops. Uh, and as I said, we're going to use uh, a difference and difference procedure uh, uh, and, uh, in, in three different dimensions. So the first uh, uh, equation here just illustrates how you can estimate a difference in difference estimate, that's uh, beta 2 we are interested in, uh, across, uh, across space. So here we compare then uh, radio owners uh, uh, with those without radio owners between two different districts, two different types of, of, of districts. The second specification is it's also a difference in difference estimate, but across, uh, but then over time, uh, within the food net districts, and the final uh, uh, regression then is that is this within household uh, 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 estimate. So just to illustrate this uh, difference in difference uh, estimate, uh, that could be easily done in this uh, two by two uh, matrix. So what we're going to look at then is uh, we're going to compare uh, informed uh, uh, households, that is households with access to radio with uninformed uh, uh, households, those without uh, a radio. And then we're going to look at the difference here. And that's what you see in the, in the last uh, column. And of course, uh, the obvious concern here is that uh, radio ownership is endogenous. Uh, for instance, we know that uh, wealthier individuals are more likely to have a, a, have a radio, for instance. So the concern there would be that maybe we're not picking up the effect of having radio in these food net districts, but something else. For instance, that the household is, is wealthier. So then we have a control group, namely the uh, household living in, in, in non-food net districts. Uh, and also here we see that there is a difference between uh, radio owners and uninformed uh, households, potentially catching up the effect of, of, uh, of, of wealth. So the difference in difference estimate then is the difference between these two uh, differences. And in this particular case, the difference in difference estimate is uh, 2.9 uh, uh, percentage, uh, percentage points. Then we can do the same thing with, uh, 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 with the difference in difference over time. Then we would replace uh, what's in the, in, the, in the rows here by, by the outcomes in 2004 and, and 1999. Again, comparing uh, uh, the differences of informed and uh, uninformed uh, households. And then actually what we can do is do one more round of, of differences, combine these two difference and difference estimates, and do a triple difference. 
Well, that's what I'm trying to illustrate in, the, in, this, um, in, in this graph. So here we have already differenced away the differences between, uh, um, uh, between uninformed and informed households. And here we have the remaining two differences then over time uh, and uh, across, um, across space. And the triple difference is what you see in this, uh, in, in this column. And the difference in difference estimate you will get by comparing this bar with this bar when you look at the differences over time, or this bar and this bar when you look at the difference, uh, sorry, this is when you look at the difference across over time, yes. And this would be the difference uh, uh, across space. And here the triple difference then when you uh, difference away all these uh, uh, time and, and, uh, uh, and district uh, fixed effects suggest that access to market information increases um, the share of outputs sold by approximately 19%. And we can do the same thing with uh, uh, the probability of selling the crop, that is the extensive margin. And here we sign that the access to market information increase the likelihood of selling the crop by 22%. And finally, uh, we can do the same thing with prices. Uh, and the difference and difference and difference estimate that suggests that access to market information increases prices by approximately uh, 15%. And what's interesting with these graphs as well is that you can, do, you can check the control, uh, the, the placebo experiment of what is actually happening uh, in... in uh, in 1999, for instance, between uh, food at the non-food net districts, by comparing this box and this box, and basically there is no, there is no difference. So what's happening? Well, you can compare what's uh, uh, happening over time uh, by comparing this and this box, and again, the, the differences are, are, are not um, are not very not very large, suggesting that um, what we are picking up here is actually the the causal effect of the of the of the program, <clears throat> as I said, we also one concern with uh, with these uh, uh, difference and difference estimate is that maybe something happened in particular in the food net district. So, for instance, one can make the argument that maybe households start to buy uh, radios when they know that uh, food net program, uh, the food net project is uh, is uh, sending out um, uh, uh, market information. And if these uh, uh, households that start to buy radio because of, uh, because of the Foodnet project are very different from uh, other radio owners, that would be a concern. And we would have a selection problem or a meter variables problem that could uh, bias our, uh, our estimate. Just looking at the summary statistics, that, is, that doesn't seem to be the case because we don't see uh, any difference in the share of, of people that had access to a radio in Foodnet and non-Foodnet districts. And we don't see any, ch any change over time either in the, in the, in the, in the growth of, 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 uh, of uh, radio ownership between Fodnet and non Fodnet districts. Anyway, this is something that we partly can control them for by looking at this difference and differences within the households. So here what we basically do then is to look at the household uh, uh, and see what happens to uh, uh, that household's uh, 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 choices of what to sell of food net crops and non-food net crops. And when we do that, I couldn't find a, uh, I couldn't figure out a nice way to show this um, in, in, a, in, a, in a figure, so I'm just gonna report it. What we find then is that these difference and difference effects are actually larger, five minutes, fine, are actually larger and, and, and highly significant. So in all these three dimensions, we find large and, and fairly precisely estimated uh, uh, fairly precisely estimated uh, effect. I haven't gone through the model here, but uh, uh, the model predicts actually has a, no a number of conditional predictions. So first of all, it predicts that the, the effects are larger for crops uh, that farmers are less able to predict the market information. And that makes a lot of sense, of course. Here we have a problem of, of uh, asymmetric information and uh, the traders uh, trying to maximize their informational rents. And these informational rents would be higher if there's a lot of fluctuation, fluctuation in, in the market price. We also find that uh, the effects will be larger, and the, by effects I mean the difference between being uh, informed and uninformed, 
uh, is going to be larger when the degree of competition between traders is, is slow. So this is something we can also uh, try to look at in the data. And what we find is that the effects are, are much larger when the variance in the market prices is high. So uh, around a 30% increase in, 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 in prices and a, uh, about a 25% increase in, in, in shares sold. And we find a similar large effect in, in, in uh, districts where the degree of competition between uh, traders appears to be, uh, uh, appears to be, uh, appears to be uh, uh, low. Okay, so let me conclude then. We, we have looked at a, 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 what we can think of a, a, a natural experiment, this Foodnet project in Uganda, to assess the effects of improved access to, to market information. And we find that improved access to market information uh, affected both the incentive and total margin and resulted in higher uh, farm gate prices. We show that these differences in outcomes is uh, magnified in, in areas where uh, or for crops that uh, experience uh, a large variation uh, over time. And these results are then consistent with a, uh, with a uh, hidden information contract model, suggesting that these problems of uh, asymmetric information can have significant redistributive and uh, uh, allocative efficiency uh, implications. And finally, let me say something about cost effectiveness. This is something we're actually working with. Uh, working, uh, working on right now, but just uh, looking at the cost of, of this FUNET program, the FUNET program, uh, they reach about 4 million uh, households, and the FUNET themselves has estimated the cost per household of providing information to, to less than 5 cents. Uh, and if we're going to do a cost-benefit analysis, which we, we're planning to do, uh, I'm sure that's going to come up uh, extremely, extremely positive. Okay, let me... Uh, conclude there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have some minutes for discussion. So anyone who would like to ask questions or debate some point, please go ahead. Three, three short questions. Yes. Uh, one was on uh, diffusion of information. So you would think that if the gains from knowing prices are big, then if the neighbor has a radio, then you should be able to get that information. So uh, have, you, have you tried to look at peer effects and diffusion there? The other was when you were looking at the extensive margin, uh, whether or not someone sold a crop. I wasn't sure how you did all the differencing because you have a nonlinear model, then did you just use a linear, did you just use a linear model? Yeah. And the third comment was that FoodNet probably provided information on crops which people wanted to market. So when you're using the crop, when you're using the differences across crops, uh, you might get an overestimate of the FoodNet effect simply because those were the ones that mattered. Uh, the ones that they got information on were the ones that were marketed. So, okay. So can okay. I answer? Uh, yes. so, so first of all. Uh, uh, we haven't really looked um, uh, more closely on externalities. It's something we, we plan to do. But uh, you know, the basic, um, uh, if anything, one would think that this uh, would lead to, an, uh, uh, to a downward bias in the results, right? Because we're comparing households here with or without wages within a district. But that's something we plan to uh, 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 look at more. Uh, that's a good point. And we are losing right here. As, as, as of now, we're using a linear model for the extensive margin. And then when it comes to the crops, uh, it's actually uh, the other, other, uh, other way around. So the FoodNet um, uh, program was um, focused on, f on food crops and not on cash crops. So I if anything, we would think that this, uh, th this again, would lead to an uh, 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 underestimation of the, uh, of the effects. Oh, thanks. Uh, yes, I have several, several speakers. Yes. So I'm not fully sure what you mean. You, you classify districts as having low and high competition. Okay, yeah. And presumably there's some difference in pricing. Right. So, 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 so what we did then is that um, uh, in order to get some information of, um, 
uh, on, uh, on, on competition, we had to rely on uh, the FoodNet data. So then we can only, the FoodNet's own market data. So then we can only focus on FoodNet uh, uh, districts. So what we actually do then is just compare within FoodNet districts, districts that have, uh, districts and crop, rather a combination of district crops where, uh, uh, where competition is low, measured as, uh, as the, the markup before the, the project was started. Uh, and what we find then is that across these different uh, markets, there is, a, uh, there is an effect, but the effect is much larger when, the, uh, when competition is low. I'm not sure I, I answered your question. But. I wondered if you compared the without the FoodNet. No, we couldn't compare without the FoodNet. Well, I mean, just the districts that had low competition and the districts that had high competition, did they already measure that without the FoodNet? Uh, right, so, so what we, what, as a measure of competition, we looked at uh, uh, market information before it was disseminated. Okay. Thank so, you. so that's uh, that's how we created the measure of, of competition. Yeah. Okay, so maybe my question is not relevant. So you don't have prices for the non food districts. We we don't have market prices for the non food districts. No. Lo then local market prices. There was a question over here, somewhere. <laughs> no. Here. how the radio program was selected to certain regions and often you could of course imagine that this was selected to regions which already had more market integration or more competition the effect is that that's what you would give us right uh, well this is the uh, food that didn't document this very well and then when we talked to them they basically said that this was uh, uh, this was this was driven by the fact that these were uh, areas where uh, uh, various local radio stations seems to be happy to, to get started in. Uh, so they started up by basically wanting to cover the whole of Uganda, but then they had to pick uh, you know, districts where there was a, uh, a, 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 a local radio station willing to, uh, to send out this information. So how did you pick your control group? So the control group is also, so the FoodNet project then was, uh, was um, uh, broadcasting in, in about 20 <coughs> districts. So the other, uh, whatever, 40 districts uh, constitute the control group here. But then we had, so the concern of course would be that there's a selection across uh, a district. Or income. Yeah, or income. And that's why we also look at the difference over time within the food net districts and actually within the households in the food net districts. So um, uh, that's the way we, it is a concern but I think we can Portly deal with it. Yes. Uh, yes, I, I was also concerned a bit with the <coughs> spillovers. Yeah. Would it be possible to compare? The, uh, would it be possible to compare uh, distant about zones to the closest radio? Do you have GPS type of information? In the, that would be one way to do it. The other is to compare with the radio. radio. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we have distance to the closest. Uh, yeah, we have, we have we. Uh, in the, um, in the 2005 data has uh, GPS information, so it's um, it's possible to do that. Yes, yes that. but we haven't done it. But also in the uh, in the crop choice model, the problem is that when you get information on those crops, you can yes. reallocate. Right. And right. then you can over yeah. so that the over right. Yes. Which yeah. is fine. Which is fine. Yeah. yeah. No, uh, the, the, that that I totally agree. So. When you get informed about some crops and receive higher prices for them, typically you would reallocate within the household and consume uh, more of other crops. And that would uh, lead to, a, you know, what we're capturing here would be the total effect then, and that total effect would be bigger, and that's actually what we, uh, what we find. But that's a, that's a very good point. Yes. All right. So, so, um, so, so, 
you know, we, we relied on, on, on uh, uh, the Uganda's own uh, household survey, which in 99 and 2005 had a crop module where they report um, uh, whether, for price, whether for crops they have sold, they uh, report the conversion factor into, into kilos. And of course, there could be some, uh, there are some problems with that, and there are, you know, there are some extreme observations in, in the data, probably because of, of uh, wrong coding there. Uh, and here, I think they, uh, those observations are actually dropped, although that doesn't really, that doesn't really matter. Uh, and the integration of markets is something we haven't really uh, done any work with yet. Again, if you just look at the, uh, the summary statistics, there's a lot of variation across, uh, across district markets, which is a bit, a bit surprising. So there seems to be room for uh, fairly large arbitrage opportunities for, for traders that are not uh, exploited uh, as of now. But it also be mentioned that this project is was up to speed around 2004. So maybe if you look at data a few years later, those, um, those markets are, are becoming more uh, integrated. That's possible. Thank you. I'm afraid we have to break off here. Thanks okay. again Thank for you. an interesting presentation. <coughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Jean-Marie Barlon from, as I quote from the program, University of Namur, France. Uh, well, that, was, that was new to me, but uh, uh, how do I anyway, whether it is in France or Belgium, uh, you will speak about uh, deforestation and decentralization in the Himalayas. Yes, so uh, thank you for inviting me here and gave uh, the opportunity to talk, about, talk a bit about a research project I had for the past five or six years on deforestation in the Himalayas. Uh, this is joint work with Pranab Bardhan, Shangamitra Das, and Dilip Mukherjee. Uh, so, uh, well, when you look to the Himalayas, forest degradation is really a major issue. It's just, it's, this is a very fragile environment. These are young mountains, and you have a lot of irreversibilities linked to erosion, siltation, floods. Uh, the siltation is, for instance, responsible for much of the floods that occurred in Bangladesh. Uh, because you have this huge uh, amount of earth that is uh, deposited on, uh, in the rivers. And also, we're also concerned, of course, about the more local externalities, like to what extent forest degradation does affect the livelihood of the people living there. And uh, among the different, well, there have not have been that many policies, but one of the major policy change that has occurred is really to delegate part of the management of the forest to the local villagers. It's really a kind of decentralization move where you endow the community or the village with the right to manage and use part of the forest. Uh, the, in my talk, I will first talk about the extent of forest degradation, then we'll look to whatever results we have. So uh, what did we do? Well, uh, we, we, we did a survey in 2002 and 2003 for two years in two northern Indian states, which is Himachal Pradesh and Uttaranchal, covering about 200 villages and in these 200 villages, we had something like 16, uh, 619 forests, which are all located in the alpine zone between 1,500 and 3,000 meters. Uh, well, and the first observation is really that going to these villages, forest is heavily degraded. Uh, we focus in my talk here, I will just focus on three measures. One is canopy cover, the other basal area, and the third one is loping grade. Canopy cover is, uh, how is it measured? Well, no, I don't have it here. Uh, for to measure canopy cover, either you can do it through that satellite imagery, looking to the, the percentage of the surface of the area which is covered by leaves or trees, if you want, by crowns, uh, by the crown of the tree, or you can do it from below using mirrors. And then you use a, the mirror is gridded with a large number of squares and just count the number of squares that are covered by leaves and the, the, the remaining being covered by the sky. That's uh, what we mean by canopy cover. When you look to canopy cover, this is the distribution over the, the, the forest that we examine. Uh, well, uh, relatively, uh, how do you say? Uh, a relatively reasonable measure of canopy cover is to say, well, uh, a well-managed forest or a natural forest would have at least 40% of canopy cover. And when you look to the, uh, to the forests we are talking about, most of them are degraded and much below that level. 
if you look to basal area, so basal area, what it is, basal area, you just uh, look to the superficy, the, 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 the area of the trunks at breast, at breast height. So you just, uh, just compute what is the, the area which would be covered by all this wood if they were, if the trunks are put next one to the other, one next, one next to the other. And so it's a measure is computed by square meters per hectare. And uh, again, the, the, there is a conventional measure here which says it's about 40 or it depends on, on, the, 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 on, the forestry, uh, on the forestry book you look at, but it's between 30 and 40 square meters per hectare. looks like a reasonable figure. Uh, you see that here, things are less worrying in some ways. The, the a large mass of the trees, or large mass of the forest, have basically enough trees, if you want, have enough wood standing uh, in the forest. The third measure we wanted to, uh, to have, which is uh, relatively new, it's not a conventional measure at all, it's called lopping. And lopping, we look at to, to, uh, how many branches have been cut along the trunk. Along the trunk. So you have uh, uh, one, uh, one tree here, which has never been cut. It's in a, it's in a sacred uh, forest, so you see that the, 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 the tree is as it should be. Uh, here, the, the tree has started to be cut from the base. You see that the villagers started to cut the branches. And here you have uh, a typical Himalayan tree, where it's exactly the same tree. There are three pine trees, the same species. But you see that the trunk has been cut from, uh, from bottom to the top. Really, it becomes really like a pole line more than, than a tree. Uh, this is for pine trees. You want to look to what happened to, uh, for broadleaf trees, like uh, what is called the Himalayan oak. Uh, the Himalayan oak, this is also, uh, okay, uh, again, a tree which has not been touched at all. This is a tree which has, where cutting has started. See, about uh, 20 or 30 percent of the trunk has been, uh, branch, uh, 20 or 30 percent of branches have been cut. And here, you have the last figure, you have exactly the same tree which has been, where all the branches have basically been cut. It's still, live, it's still alive, huh? but uh, you still have some leaves, but basically the, the tree uh, is nowhere. So uh, when you look to lopping grade per forest, uh, you see that many, many, many of those trees in this, uh, in this forest are heavily lopped, more than 60%. Yeah? Let's, uh, let's say 60%, two-thirds of the tree as being the, uh, the, the signal that forest is heavily degraded you see that the degradation measure above, uh, above two-thirds is really, you have many, many forests there. Uh, so uh, it's also interesting to note that there is some correlation between these measures, but you cannot say that the correlation is perfect. So your, uh, the correlation is point, uh, between, for example, canopy cover, so the, the amount of, uh, the, amount of the, uh, the, the percentage of the area which is covered by leaves, if you want, and lopping grade, it's minus 60, but you see that you have a lot of variation still, which uh, motivates the fact that we want to use each of, those each of these measures separately. Uh, so to summarize this, forest degradation, well, the number of trees, if you want the, the, the stock of wood, is relatively satisfactory in these areas. You have enough trees per hectare. But uh, by contrast, canopy cover and loping rates are much more alarming. Which, what, does it, what does it indicate? It indicates that you have a lot of short run exploitation of the forest, short run exploitation by taking branches and leaves. The quality of the tree is extremely low, which implies stunted growth, which implies low resistance to, uh, to freeze, to, to rain, to uh, well, the, the movement of the earth. I don't remember how you call that. And uh, basically, low biomass production also. It basically, it, in, a, in, an, in economic terms, would be to, it's totally inefficient as a way to manage the forest. And uh, well, we also ran a large number of results survey. I won't talk about them today, but the, the, the mean time to collect, and it's a recall data, so it's what it is, but uh, the mean time to collect has increased by about 60% over the past 25 years. Uh, just to show you some pictures, uh, well, it's not that nice. Huh? Well, the, village, the village is here, and then you see all those trees here around the village, and those trees are typically heavily degraded. You see, they are, they are all pole trees. It's no more a forest. Uh, same thing here, this is where you have also some natural disasters, some of the, some of the trees have basically fallen down, but uh, those trees are badly degraded here also, same thing, you have those trees here at the back which are uh, really pole trees and no more uh, proper trees. Uh, we, 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 we also, well, the survey was detailed in the sense that we, we hired forestry, uh, forestry trained people who went to the forest and spent a week in the forest measuring everything, and uh, what, they, the, what they measure is the incidence of different activities. So they measure in the forest incident, oh, sorry. 
the measure in the forest incident of, the incident of grazing, to the extent they could see trail marks by, uh, by left by the cattle, to the extent they were, uh, uh, well, how could they measure how, how many cows did they, did they find during a week in the, in the forest, and so on. You see, and you see that there is a relatively high incidence of grazing. There is also a very high incidence of lopping, which is something I insist most, uh, most upon, and lopping is really cutting branches. Well, if you look to timber cutting, timber cutting is, pro is severely regulated, it's basically prohibited. So that's why we found relatively low evidence of, well, relatively low evidence of timber cutting, and snow and fire are, are almost as important as timber uh, removal in explaining part of the degradation. But uh, the, 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 I, I just want to just show you this picture, this table, because I, the, it seems that the two major human activities that are leading to degradation is grazing and lopping, and among these, basically lopping, which, is, which explains also the uh, insistence on firewood collection in those areas, because we think that this is really the, the major driving uh, feature. Now, uh, let's just move now to the, the topic of the talk, which is really decentralization. So uh, what happened? Well, in, uh, in Nepal, in 1993, they started a very large program it's called the FUG, FUG for Forest User Group, uh, where you basically you delegate part of the for delegate management rights to the parts of the forest to the village. So the village has to has to form a group, and the group is responsible for managing for planting. They they have even uh, allowed to cut the trees in uh, in Nepal, and uh, the the project was successful in the sense that in 2007, about 40 percent of the population is involved in FUG activities. Uh, and Eric Edmonds, in uh, early work in 2001, showed that the creation of FUG, at least the, in the very short run, if you looked uh, two years later, it's, it's associated with a fall in a firewood collection by about 10 to 15 percent. Meaning those households collect less firewood once they are involved in a, FUG, in a forest user group. Now, uh, if you look to uh, Uttarankhand or Uttaranchal, uh, if you look to Uttarankhand, in India there is a long tradition, which dates back to the British colonizers, starting in 1930, uh, of local forest management delegated to the village, which is known as the Van Panchayat. Van Panchayat is the, name for the, uh, the local name for the Forest Village Committee. And these forest committees are basically based on voluntary participation of villagers. The villagers have to associate, go to the, uh, the government officials to get exclusive rights on some parcels of the forest, some parts of the forest, uh, including, uh, well, except for timber, even though there are regulations that you can still cut some timber, but you, you need authorization for this. But it's not for commercial timber, it's really for uh, domestic use. And uh, over the past year, there is a, with the decentralization, the decentralization wave that occurred in the late 90s, early 20, early uh, 21st century, you had a, a large expansion of these vampanchayats with mixed evaluation, uh, as we shall see. Uh, the, the, the first systematic evaluation that was carried out was by uh, some Anatan and others who use, who use satellite imagery to evaluate ground cover and compare Van Panchayat forest to open access forest or state reserve forest, which are the three major type of forest. So Van Panchayat forest are the one managed by the Van Panchayat. Open access forest are forest are normally for, nominally forest, but where, with no uh, rights or with no, uh, re rule, ne no real rules of access to that forest. So it's basically an open access. And then you have a state reserve forest where access is formally more difficult. And you can't, uh, typically, you don't have access to timber, but you have also less access to grazing uh, pasture or uh, firewood, which are, they are typically normally protected and managed by the state administration. And their methodology is really to compare, to compare neighboring forests with different property status uh, or controlling for topography. And the result is really that ground cover in Van Panchayat Forest are, do not worse than state-protected for, state forest, uh, and they do, uh, they do better you know, than open access forest. Something like uh, an increase in forest quality by about 12%. And uh, so they, they conclude that uh, decentralization is really worth it uh, because it's much more efficient than the, the state bureaucracy at a much, more, much lower fiscal cost, and they provide some estimate of that, but the cost-benefit analysis is pretty obvious here. Uh, now, what do we do? Well, we want to do the same thing with our own survey data in Uttarankan on the three measures of forest quality that we have. So instead of using satellite imagery, which is really, you have only one measure, which is this crown cover, we use uh, the, all the measures we have. Here I talk about the three major ones that, uh, that, that we use, the canopy cover, basal area, and uh, lopping, to compare forest with 
different status within the same topo village controlling for topography. Uh, no, there, there, is, there is a large number of methodological issues here. It's not, it's easy to say just compare, but obviously uh, you have a lot of problems. The first problem is really unobserved village characteristics, and we try to control for that by using village fixed effects. You have also endogenous selection, obviously. Uh, Van Patschania forests are not randomly selected forests. They are chosen to be, uh, to be managed by Van Panchaya, so they may be placed in forests with more potential, or may be placed in forests with less potential if the state wants to. Uh, want to show that those decentralization things don't work. Uh, so what we will do, we will also use aspect and slope as uh, to see whether these topographical measures predict anything about the, van the probability of being becoming a Van Panchayat forest. If not, then it means that the location of the Van Panchayat forest is not related to topographical characteristics, which imply that it's unlikely that uh, these forests were selected because uh, in that those area because they were in a better uh, situation or better potential. You have also some, another problem is really the spillover problem. It's fine to manage properly your, your forest and restricting rules of access, have restrictive rules of access, it implies that villagers will then just go to the next forest and collect whatever they can. So we may overestimate uh, the impact of uh, the, 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 the Van Panchayat property rights. And then we have on top of that, we have the problem that Van Panchayats are heterogeneous. Some have been founded in 1930, others have been founded in 1997, 1998, and what do we do with that? So we'll try to, well, we try to go through all of these carefully. Uh, the first thing I wanted to show to you is really the, how, uh, how can we predict the probability that the forest will be a Van Panchayat forest? And you, you see that in this figure, uh, if you look to the three measures of topography we use here, which is aspect, whether it is north or south facing or west or east, uh, whether uh, we use the slope and we use the altitude, those three topographic, measure, uh, topographic measures do not predict anything about the Van Panchayat forest. Uh, what is pre the, the, the major predictor is really the distance to the forest, distance between the village and the forest, which pretty obviously Van Panchayat forests are located closer to the village, so that's to be expected. And uh, also there is something about percentage of broadleaf that we will control for that, but it seems that Van Panchayat forests are more uh, of the broadleaf type instead of the pine, uh, of the pine uh, type. Uh, so what do we conclude? We conclude that Van Panchayat forests do not seem to be located in better forests, in better areas with more potential. At least that's the way we can think about it. Now, uh, what we do here is really to compare, uh, let us take our three measures, which is canopy cover, basal area, and lopping, so the, uh, column one, uh, two, and four. Uh, and we, comp we compare uh, state protected forests to Van Panchayat forests, so those forests which have been put under Van Panchayat management, and those forests which are open access forests, which is called their civil soyam, which is basically it's an open access forest. And what do we find? Well, uh, nothing much on canopy cover, nothing much basal area, basal volume, neither is the same, almost the same measure. But when you look to lopping, you can see that there's much less lopping occurring in the Van Panchayat forests. And nothing on regeneration, but regeneration is a difficult issue, so I don't, I don't want to talk about it here. Uh, no, uh, so Van Panchayat have an effect. They lead to, the, they seem to be associated with less short-term exploitation compared to the state-protected forests. If we look to the, uh, if we compare now new and old Van Panchayats, let us split the sample between Van Panchayat who have been created at least more than 25 years ago to Van Panchayat who have been created within the, uh, the past 25 years. What do we find? We find that the old Van Panchayat, the, the, the one which was created a long time ago, have now an impact on canopy cover and have a strong impact on lopping. It is interesting to see that the new Van Panchayat uh, forests have a lower basal area, which means that these are forests where you have less trees to start with, and lopping is slightly smaller, which means that short-term exploitation is also, is also smaller. So the story that goes here is really to say, well, if anything, it seems that the, the forests that are given to the Van Panchayata forests are more degraded, uh, but very quickly villagers start to exploit them less. And this has an a long run impact, which is a better forest in terms of canopy cover and in terms of lopping. And we control here, we control the spillover expect by, looking, by uh, directly putting the competing for in the same village, what is the, uh, what, how, how many hectares are covered by Van Panchayat forest, how many hectares are covered by state protected forest, and so on, which is a way to control for these potential spillover effects. And you see that the Van Panchayat forest has no, has no spillover effects on, on the other forest. 
while state protected forest has some spillover effect, uh, which are negative. Huh? They lead to lower, uh, lower canopy cover in uh, non-state forest and lead to increased uh, lopping in non-state forests. Uh, yes, so how much time do I have? Or it's about ten minutes. Ten minutes. Oh well, uh, I have too much, so that's nice. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. We'll yes, see. yes. We never know. <laughs> never trust. <laughs> so if we uh, so coming to this decentralization, if we compare uh, Van Bans Oh, sorry. No, I have to do F five. Sorry, I went too quickly. Repeat all this. That's my way to waste our time. I'm sorry. Uh, no, uh, if we, no, so if we look to uh, the difference between Van Panjaniat and State Forest, we find no difference in terms of canopy cover, no difference in terms of base area, and some difference in terms of short rate exploitation, which we call lopping. It's really lopping of branches. Van Panjaniat and Open Access Forest, not much different either, except also with respect to lopping. Now, if we look to uh, all Van Panjaniat and State Forest, there is a big difference in canopy cover. Canopy cover is larger and much less lopping. In the new Van Panchayat have lower basal area and lower lopping. Uh, so uh, Van Panchayat forest exhibits much lower lopping and we don't see any spillover there. Uh, it's possible that Van Panchayats are not created, so Van Panchayats are not created on less degraded forest and on more favorable soils. New Van Panchayat are currently less effective, but they may be too new or they may be less genuine or effective. It's hard to know exactly what is going on, but they, they don't have the large effect that we uh, have for old Van Panchayats. Now, uh, the, the last point, really my last slide, really something that I would like to, to work upon in the future is really to think a bit more about the distributive impact of this decentralization. It looks nice to delegate everything to the village, but we know very little about the power structure within this village, and we know very little to who really benefits from this decentralization in the villages. Uh, so distributive impact is relatively unclear. There is a, uh, well, there is one study which has been done on Nepal, on FUG, which tend to show that uh, in this FUG program, the, uh, to the FUG revenues are directly collected at the village level and are supposed to finance uh, public, uh, local public works. Uh, but what, they, what it seems to suggest is that it, basically, it, it mo mostly benefited the local elite. Uh, the, 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 rich, uh, the, the rich villagers uh, were able to buy their timber at a much lower price, subsidized price in some ways, through the FUG, and also they, they were gaining more through the local employment and so on. So it's not clear that uh, the distributive, distributive impact of this decentralization move is necessarily positive, but we need to do more work on this. Uh, and then there is also, as we are in social science conference, I thought that we should say something about gender. Uh, but. Uh, you, well, well, no, it's a joke. Uh, but uh, you had some gender effect that we don't really, we don't measure properly. We don't know exactly what's going on. There is one uh, uh, Indian economist, Bina Garwal, who spent some time in the villages interviewing the woman. And uh, she found that the woman felt basically dispossessed by the creation of those one panchayat. As soon as you created those one panchayat, all the men were going to participate to the things, while the traditional users were really the woman. And... Uh, and they are the ones who bear most of the cost of the decentralization regulation, because they are the ones who have to look harder for firewood and so on. Uh, and uh, well, it's interesting to have those two quotes, which, is, uh, which came from these interviews. Uh, one, quote, one woman says, well, if you are to attend meetings, the men will say, oh, you haven't cooked my meal on time. What happened to my tea? And uh, another one says, well, people don't like it when we speak, we mean the women, at the meetings. They think that women are becoming too very smart. Which is, and I end with this. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice, interesting. Um, we have time, plenty of time for comments, actually. And may I remind you, when you speak, to use the microphone, because the organizers are making recording all the proceedings. And also, people will hear better what you say. So, comments? Um, questions? Yes. So, Jean-Marie, could you perhaps elaborate a bit on this Van Panchayat, how they actually work? Uh, so it's actually, of course, it's giving property rights to, to this uh, forest, which uh, otherwise would be either common access or controlled by the state. So 
but how, exactly how is it organized and how do they protect the forest from, from others and so on? Well, uh, it varies a lot, but it's basically, so it's a village committee, which meets regularly, and they organize, they have access, so they have a well-defined area to which they have access, and they define, the, they can define plantation programs, they can, they, they can define rules of use, rule of access, when do you go to, to graze your animals, uh, how do you get your fodder, how do you get your uh, firewood, they have also rules about how the, the, the technique to cut firewood, because when you have this, uh, Anarchy, anarchist, uh, well, this uh, completely anarch, uh, anarchist way to, to cut trees, it's really bad for the tree. Well, you, if you cut it properly, uh, it basically root trees, it's close to pruning and it leads to uh, better growth. And they also have some rules about timber, even though timber it can only be used for domestic purposes. The timber cannot be sold for commercial purposes. Uh, so they, they, they meet, I think, at least four, more, four, four times a year. So it's really, it's a pretty uh, intensive, uh, pretty intensive institution, and they really, they, they also have joint activities. Some of those from Panchayat, well, some, let's say at least half of them, uh, hire also guards to monitor the forest. So you have uh, an appointed guard who really supposed, is supposed to uh, guard the forest, be in the forest, and check whether the rules are really uh, abided by. Now, to what extent this is effective, I'm not able to judge, but uh, and it requires really an, another type of work, but. Uh, you, you, so you, you have some monitoring also system that are really put into place. Uh, I can't say much more than that. Uh, but timber exploitation is much more frequent in Nepal, where forest users who can cut their own wood and sell it to the markets and so on. They can, uh, uh, they, they can do charcoal, they, can, they have much, much more freedom of the, in their use than what uh, they have in India. Yes. This property right issue is an important issue, at least in Nepal. This is more like a comment because, uh, I mean, what, what the user groups did was to uh, restrict access to the forest. So there is a, like a distributional issue here. So, so you use the forest as, you, the households that got control of the forest, they still use the forest in the same way they did before, but other groups are not allowed into the forest from neighboring villages. So maybe you can comment on that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's different with India. In India, you, you need not be part of the Van Panchayat to have access to Van Panchayat forest. But you need to abide by the rules. While it's true that in Nepal, you must be part of the Fuji, which explains also the very high participation rates in the, in the program. I have a similar question to, uh, to Magnus. Uh, uh, so I guess it can be compared to some extent to, to take the big picture to enclosure movement in yeah. uh, in England, and, and, and of course there were variation across uh, Vampanchayas that would be interesting to explore. But it's just uh, like Mongu said, that there's access to the forest is denied for people are living at a distance. So I think there are variation that, that uh, do you have any ideas how you could, do you have information about, uh, about that? I, I guess uh, there, are, there are cross country variation in this uh, as Mongu yeah, yeah, because the, the information I have here is really on India. So. Uh, uh, and all villagers have access to one particular forest. So we, we do have information on that. We know how much firewood they collected from each type of forest, at least uh, what they report in the surveys. I'm not claiming too much. Uh, so uh, yes, you know, we didn't do that yet, but in principle, we can do that. What we did so far in this research program, it's really a research program, we did so far is really to estimate firewood collection equations. Uh, so we want to predict who, which, what, are the, what are the households which collect firewood and there, Van Panchayat seems to play a role. Those villages where you have a Van Panchayat tend to, uh, tend to collect less firewood, collect and use less firewood. Uh, now, the, the, I think in, in, this, in, the, in this other paper that we wrote, the, the, the most important finding is really the fact that the, the time to collect, the households are, very, are not very sensitive to the cost of collection. So the time to collect, you, uh, or the opportunity cost of collecting uh, firewood does not seem to uh, influence a lot the, the amount of firewood collected, which is a bit of a worry if you take it from an ecology perspective, because what, what we would like to have is something like, well, the forest gets degraded, then people take longer to collect their firewood, so they will collect less firewood, and you, we will reach something like a stable equilibrium uh, where you will still have some forest left. But that's not what seems to be happening. What seems to be happening is that the, uh, the elasticity with respect to collection time is very, very small, uh, so people will continue to collect firewood even if they have to spend hours and hours on this. It's not, 
And uh, the, the time to collect has already increased a lot over the past 25 years, while the amount collected has almost not, uh, almost not changed. Uh, but that's uh, more like the, uh, that's another paper in some ways. But we didn't look really to the, yeah, I would like to look more about distributive impact and really who has access to what, and, but that's really part of the future project. Yeah. Okay. Um, could you maybe go back to your slides where you presented the regressions? Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, maybe I didn't get it right, but are those all separate regressions that you, that you did? Yes, yes, for okay. each measure. So I was wondering, to what extent do those dependent variables not correlate with each other? They are, they are. They do? They are, yes. So why would you They are, but they are not perfectly correlated. Right. Uh, so what would you... What would you do? Well, well, probably I would try and, and, I don't know, maybe get some variable that actually integrates them. A kind um, of index or something? Sorry? A kind of index or something? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Because I'm not sure what, what we should get from this. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the point is precisely that, is that if you just look to canopy cover, or basal area, as most forestry studies do, Basically, you have a wrong picture because nothing, nothing really is going on there. Uh, what the, 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 the major effect is really through lopping. And, that tree, and lopping is hard to measure unless you go to the forest and you really look to the tree and uh, compute the, the percentage of the trunk that has been, uh, where the branches have been taken. And, uh, so it's really short-term exploitation, which is directly related to firewood collection and grazing needs and for the needs. That's, that's what we stress, really. That's, uh, that, okay. So that, that justifies why we did that, really. We wanted to avoid, wait, of course, we, we, we could construct some index and say, well, I have an index of degradation. I don't think we would find much because the only difference really comes from lopping. But uh, the, the, the point is really that, is that th those measures are different. And if you look to short-term exploitation, really the first short-term exploitation you can think of is really lopping. Okay. Then and then you may come to canopy cover in some ways, which is the second one. And then third one would be basal area, basal volume, which measure the trunks. Okay, and then my second point in your conclusion. Um, so what can we actually learn uh, from the project? Is it really good that if decentralization actually has a very negative impact on the, on the females? Yeah, well, I'm just, <laughs> I don't know. I would like to know more. I, what, what we have there is really a study which is really impressionistic. It's really interviewing 30, 30 women and getting a sense of their participation to the local uh, authority structure. So that's what we have. Uh, it, this has some value, but it's not like, I cannot say I would, I completely trust that last slide I saw. I just say, well, uh, it, there are some indication there that, that, that would need more work to really understand what are the costs within the family what are the cost of decentralization. And it's really part of the distributive impact of decentralization that I would like to work more on. Uh, but I, I'm not claiming anything, just saying, well, if you look to the, in terms of efficiency of the forest, you, if your first objective is really to protect the forest, Van Panchaya don't do worse than state forests, they cost much less, so let's do that. Uh, that's the simple cost-benefit analysis. No, that, that's what I would say. Okay. <laughs> yes? Yes. Up a, a little bit. Um, I think in, in, um, in a, another slide you showed that uh, the old and the new yeah. from Panchayat. And here I saw a, a negative sign come in the basal area and in the one where you lumped them together, it was positive. So here I'm mostly interested if you could explain or elaborate, elaborate a little bit more uh, on the mechanisms that actually transfer from the Fund Panchayat in age, because I yeah. also see a large, larger effect yeah. of the old Fund Panchayat to the different types of uh, forest yes. management. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the story as I see it is that basically, uh, the, the forests that are given to the, to the villagers are worse forests at the start. There are forests where you have less tree, which explain why basal area is smaller in new Van Panchayats. But uh, as soon as they got this management, uh, this managing institution, they start to collect, to collect less firewood and less fodder from those forests. And in the long run, this translates into a better lopping measure, but also better canopy cover with no real difference in basal area, but we, we already saw that the basal area does not seem to be the problem if you look to uh, Himalayan forests. Not the number of trees that matters, it's really the quality of those trees. Which also is also a kind of answer to uh, the, the earlier question that's ask, asking me, why don't you try to lump all those measures together? We don't want to, because, because precisely that, the number of trees is fine. 
But it's really the quality of those three, which is a complete disaster, and it's related to human exploitation, uh, to human pressure. Yes? Uh, hello? Uh, for what I understood, there are uh, positive effects on the looping in, in itself. Yeah on the economical issue also, it's much less expensive. But, uh, but in, the, in the end it says, decentralization is promoting uh, the similarities, uh, if maybe you could put the last one, because I'm not so good with my memory, uh, with distributive impact. Could it be arguable that it's not in decentralization in itself, but it, in the way that it was constructed? Could, could, it, could, we, could we admit that um, another way that would involve more stakeholders in the villages, let's put it this way, how, how hard would, we, would it be to transform to, to a more, um, to also solve this part of a sustainable development? Yeah. I, I find it very hard to answer the question. So I, it's really, it's not a discipline. Uh, as an economist, I, have, I don't have much, much to say on this, but I, there's also, there also been a big difference between the old Vipan Sayat, which really created somewhat spontaneously by the villagers, and the Vipan Panchayat created over the past 10 years, where the, the World Bank poured a lot of money to create those one Panchayat and decentralization and so on, and the Indian government was very much involved into that. And uh, obviously, those new one Panchayat have been created very quickly. They relaxed the rules to create a one Panchayat. You, before, I think you needed uh, at least... Uh, one third of the villagers, while now you only need 20 villagers. Well, you, 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 so they relax the rule also to create a Van Panchayat, and that also may have, may uh, be related to uh, a negative impact of the local elite, but uh, yes. But I, I would like to dig more into this, it's really, who really gains, who really loses, but, uh, but I, I fully agree that obviously the way it is, it is done has an impact on, should have an impact on the, the outcomes. Come on. Uh, I want to ask if you have here a story of uh, tragedy of the commons, and if you have data on private, or if there are private forests in this region. No, there, there are no real private forests, so that's, and uh, it's really, well, just to go back to my pictures, I like the pictures, I must say. Uh, well, this is really, this is what I would call a tragedy of the commons, you know. They, you have a village, everyone cuts the, cuts the trees that are closest to their house, and that's what you, that's what you get. Uh, you could produce much more firewood by well-managed forests, and that's, so it's really, it's an inefficient way of doing things, and it's really part of the tragedy of the commons. That's what we, that's what we argue. Okay. You just got the question again? Yes, yes, you're true. So a question on this, uh, the spillover effect. Uh, yes, so this one. Yeah. yeah. That one, yeah. So, so you try to control for that by having the acre or hectares of competing forest, and uh, it's a positive sign there. So the more competing forests to have, the more lopping in the Panchayat forest, or how is it working? Uh, so, uh, no, we, so this is the, the, so this is the amount, it's, it's a measure of the amount of fat Panchayat forest in the village, and to what extent having more than Panchayat forest increase the canopy cover on the forest you are looking at. Take a forest and look to all, all the forests surrounding that, that forest, and uh, so the, the more than Panchayat we have, the, it has no impact on the canopy cover of the forest you are looking at. <clears throat> but if you have a lot of state protected forest around your forest, it has a negative impact. That's but and a positive impact on the lopping. Uh, and a positive impact on lopping. Meaning, if you have a lot of state protected forest, villagers don't like to go there. Well, it's regulated, it's hard to have access anyway. So you prefer to go to open access or than Panchayat forests. <laughs> So you go to the forest with another, uh, with another proper type of motivation. Yes. Normally, how do you explain the lopping versus canopy cover? From the pictures, I would think that if you have more, if you lop more, then you should have yeah. less canopy cover. In but the long run, in the medium run, let's say. Yes. So really, the short run is really lopping. Medium run, it's canopy cover. Long run is really based on the rear. And what we see is a lot of, yes. But if you, lop, if you lop these branches, then they don't have leaves on them. Exactly. So then they should have less In the long run, you should have less canopy cover, which we don't find, we don't find anything here. I, can, I can't say we, but. So I'm wondering whether one possible explanation is that when you lop, you get firewood, but when you take leaves, you get fodder. Yeah. 
And so it's possible looking at this that you lop less, so you use less firewood from the forest, but you use just as many, as many leaves. So is that, uh, do you think that's a possibility? The other, the other thing was when you look at the percentage of forest, you might want to look at the quality of that forest because there may be rules that determine how, how much of a village is one panchayat. But the quality of the state versus one panchayat versus uh, reserved. Oh, so you would include the measures here. Of quality one, here, you might get something. In this competing, having a competing area and competing quality right. or something right. there. Have some measure. Yeah, ideally we'd like to have biomass, um, which is something that I, we may do at some point looking to more on a kind of archaeological approach with the biomass extraction and so on. But uh, so far we have not been able to do that. But uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. On the first point, yes, I, I don't know. I just... I find it still uh, interesting that the, for the old Valpanchayat, more than 20 years ago, you have an effect on canopy cover, which is really the long run impact. Uh, or long run impact of lower loping. I think, I think that's the story at least we get. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much again. Our third paper is by Kjetil Bjurvatten of the Norwegian School of Economics here in Bergen. And it's entitled The Productive Poor, Teaching Entrepreneurship in Tanzania. which is slightly different from uh, the title here, but it's, a, it's the same paper, uh, which is also an exaggeration because uh, it's a work in progress uh, and uh, there's still no paper, but there's a presentation, which I will present to you now. It's a joint work with uh, Lars Iva Berge, PhD student of ours, and uh, Bertil Tungodden, all from the Norwegian School of Economics and Business Administration. Let's see how I can do this. So this is how I plan my talk. I'll motivate what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to talk about the research design. I'm going to talk about the treatment, uh, which is a training program in Tanzania. We can talk about uh, the lab, which, uh, which, which, which we have implemented, and then some conclusions. So in terms of motivation, um, let me just refer to this uh, interview I had with uh, this microfinance entrepreneur in Dar es Salaam um, a few months ago. And uh, she, we were sitting down and talking about her, uh, about her, her dreams and her uh, aspirations and the, 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 the difficulties she, she faced in her business life. And uh, she told us that she would like to learn more about accounting. Because uh, her plan was to start a, a makeup salon. Uh, but then she needed more people to operate that salon. And, then she needed to, when expanding the business and opening this makeup salon, she needed to keep track of the money. And for that purpose, she needed to stay in control. And to stay in control, she needed to know more about accounting. So she expressed uh, uh, a desire to, to have more business skills in order to fulfill her dreams, her dream here being then to, to start this makeup salon. And uh, this was uh, one example of an entrepreneur, a small-scale entrepreneur in, in, in Tanzania. And uh, indeed, if you look at developing countries, there are, there are so many uh, entrepreneurial people around, and it's really impressive what they can do. And the potential in terms of uh, employment creation uh, from small-scale uh, entrepreneurs is, is, is tremendous. And as I said, it's impressive what they do, given the quite um, you know, meager business opportunities, small markets, uh, information problems that we've heard about, and so on. Um, and, and some, you know, they, they succeed, but, uh, and sometimes uh, assisted by microfinance. But still, uh, we see a lot of unfulfilled potential. Um, uh, even in, in the microfinance entrepreneurs, which we have been working with, uh, while repayment rates are very high, there are also problems of huge dropout rates. And there are very few signs of you know, ma major graduation. So the, the typical pattern is that a small-scale entrepreneur takes a small loan and, uh, 
and uh, you know, runs his or her small scale business, but we see very little graduation into to larger scale businesses. Um, we also see a lot of concentration into some particular activities like running a kiosk and operations which might not have a very high growth potential. So there are, there are some, it's impressive what they do and uh, sometimes helped by microfinance, uh, they, they get things going for themselves or their families, but we see quite little graduation. Uh, our hypothesis then is that uh, we can make graduation happen uh, we can make these businesses flourish even more by giving them knowledge and some inspiration by, by training them. Do they need training? Well, uh, some say it's obviously true that they need training. Some are more skeptical. And this is one skeptic uh, saying that I firmly believe that all human beings have an innate skill. I call it the survival skill. The fact that the poor are alive is clear proof of their ability. They do not need us to teach them how to survive. They already know. The proof is in the pudding, so to speak. So rather than waste our time teaching new skills, we try to maximize use of their existing skills. Giving the poor access to, the credit, to credit allows them to immediately put into practice the skills they already know. And who said this? Well, uh, Muhammad Yunus in the book uh, Bank to the Poor. So to Muhammad Yunus, uh, let's not waste time on training. Give them credit. They know what they need to know. They are, after all, they're alive. Well, uh, we're going to, to, uh, to, to challenge this view. And uh, we, are, we have, uh, I'll tell you what we've done. But it's, it's about giving training, offering training to small-scale entrepreneurs. And uh, the, the main question we ask is then, has this training had an effect? Has it allowed people like the woman I just I, that I showed you that I interviewed, has it allowed her to open her beauty salon, her makeup salon, to expand, to employ people outside her family, uh, job creation? Um, so does it, does it con contribute to, to income growth among microfinance, small scale among microfinance entrepreneurs, in the short run and in the long run? Moreover, uh, is training, which is, after all is costly, a more efficient way of promoting income growth than simply giving a cash transfer. You can imagine you have, as a donor, you want to promote um, economic growth among small-scale entrepreneurs. You can either give it in the form of training, like we do, or you can give it as an investment grant, a grant to the business. Which type of, uh, of, uh, of intervention is the most efficient? So that's another intervention we do. To measure these, uh, the effect uh, of, of this, uh, these two treatments, the training and the business grant, we use survey data and we use information from the microfinance institution, so bank data. So, number, so the, that's the, the effect of business training uh, that's the, uh, and on the, of the uh, business grant, that's the, the most important questions. But we are also interested in knowing more about the mechanisms. So let's say we observe some kind of impact of training or business grant. What are the mechanisms? What's going on? And we have two main categories, two main channels through which uh, training can work. Uh, one is by providing skills, like accounting. Giving this woman accounting skills, so that allowing her to operate a, a larger business or more businesses. Uh, accounting, uh, marketing skills, and skills in analyzing the market and so on. But we can also imagine that a, a, train, a course, a business training program can inspire poor people, poor entrepreneurs to, uh, to do things, give them confidence, um, maybe reduce or, well, change their perspective on, on, on time, on time preferences, making them more patient, more willing to, to delay consumption, to invest maybe affect their, their, uh, their degree of risk aversion and thereby, invest, uh, thereby affect uh, their, their business operations. So we're interested in the, in the mechanisms of the effects, the possible success. Uh, and we, we, we then look at, at mindset and uh, in, in entrepreneurial skills. And uh, how do we measure the effect uh, of training on their 
uh, mindset of skills, well, we, have, uh, we invited uh, a subsample of our clients to a lab. And this is, is uh, what I will report mostly from today. Well, back to the, uh, to the, to the research design of this, uh, of this uh, pr research program of ours. We're working with, uh, with Pride Tanzania, which is the, the largest microfinance institution in, in Tanzania with 250,000 clients. This is one branch of Pride in Dar es Salaam. They have five branches in Dar es Salaam. This is the Magomeni branch, as you can see, and this is one of the branches that we've been working with for our project. We have uh, divided uh, microfinance clients into a treatment and a control group. Um, and these were randomly selected from, from, uh, from microfinance clients in this Pride system. So what we did was to first uh, select randomly two, two of these five uh, pride branches in Dar es Salaam. And within these two branches, we randomly selected uh, in each branch one day for training and one day for control. Um, as you can see, we have uh, in this Magomeni branch I just uh, showed a picture of, we have uh, uh, chosen uh, control clients from, from the people who show up at their weekly loan meetings uh, on Mondays. And from uh, the, so the treated from Magomeni branch are the people who show up on their, for, on their weekly loan meetings on Tuesday. And similarly from the other uh, branch, we have both the Bogoruni branch, Wednesday control clients, and then Thursday uh, treatment clients from the Bogoruni branch. So, and then, then uh, we chose within these clients that meet on, uh, every week, we chose uh, clients at the intermediate levels of, uh, of loans. They have a loan ladder and we we targeted the intermediate clients because we did. We tried to avoid the uh, the freshmen because that was a lot. There was a lot of instability there. So to have some kind of stability, we chose the intermediate level clients. And in total, 650 clients were selected for our uh, for our purpose. The business grant, which is the other main intervention, uh, it involves uh, a, a grant of 100,000 T shillings, which is about 60 euros. And this uh, business grant was given then to a subset of the entrepreneurs in our sample, both in the treatment and in the, in the control group. And so this is a, a sketch of how, we, how the group is organized. We have uh, group number one here, we, oops, sorry, uh, which consists of 220 individu individuals which have uh, received only business training. Then we have uh, 105 individuals which have received uh, who have received uh, both business training and a business grant. We have uh, 105 clients who have received only the business grant, and then uh, 220 who are the pure control group who have received neither a business grant nor training. This is the timeline of the project. Um, we had the, the baseline survey in June and July last year. The training was implemented from August to, uh, last year to January this year. Uh, the business grant was uh, handed out in March this year, and the lab was also carried out in March this year, and I'll report from that lab soon. We will have uh, shortly a follow-up survey, which will be uh, to interview the same 650 clients again at their place of work, ask them questions about uh, their profits, uh, their sales, their employment, and so on. And then again, to, f to capture the long-term effect, we will interview the same 650 clients in the summer of 2010. This is the treatment, this is, this is the training. Um, and we cooperate with the, the University of Dar es Salaam. Uh, so it was not obviously me teaching this course, it's a course taught in, in Swahili by professional trainers from the Entrepreneurship Center in, in Dar es Salaam. And they, they, have, uh, they have developed a, a uh, a business training program uh, targeted to this level of entrepreneurs. They're professional trainers, they, they offer training to entrepreneurs, but typically at higher level entrepreneurs who can pay for this kind of training. So this pr training, training program was developed um, particularly for these uh, this low level entrepreneurs. And here's one session. So these, uh, these are the, um, the clients uh, showing up at their weekly loan meeting. Right after they've done their business, they will go to this classroom and receive a 45-minute training every week. And that took place then every week uh, for a few months from August 2008 until January 2009. 
and what kind of topics were covered in this, uh, in this uh, program. Well, they talked about what is it to be an entrepreneur. Uh, they talked about planning, uh, customer care and marketing tools, managing your business, your workers and yourself, calculating costs and profits uh, prices, and cash management. All in all, 21 sessions. Um, the average attendance was quite good. It was very good, actually. So 70% on average uh, attendance at this class. Um, 83% uh, showed up for more than half of the classes and thereby qualified to a diploma, which we gave them. Uh, this uh, diploma was handed to them at the graduation ceremony, which is, this is a picture from the graduation ceremony, which took place January 27th uh, this year. And it was a big party with uh, dancing and the representatives from the government and so on. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. You can see they're very happy. This again is showing training attendance. You can see that uh, some of the clients, uh, you know, some never showed up at all, and some showed up just a few times, but the majority showed up to, to most of the, of the classes. We, we talked to, to the participants to get some kind of feeling about uh, how the course was impacting them, had affected them. And here are some anecdotes talking to the, to the clients. Client one says, I never used to honor appointments with my customers, and I was a liar but I've changed this behavior. Even my customers have been surprised to see this change. I thank Pride and professors from the University of Dar es Salaam. Client two says, I was very happy to know that I should treat my employees as customers, treat them with respect. I put the 10 commandments of customer service, which was something they were talking about and taught at class, on the wall of my shop and my customers are really impressed. And I earned 5,000 shillings yesterday from my friend after training him about good customer service. So these are entrepreneurs making business out of this uh, training program. Number three says, whenever I receive any money from my customer, I say, thank you, asante sana. <laughs> my customers have been so much impressed. Again, talking to this businesswoman I showed you a picture of earlier, she, she was one of the participants in, the, in this course, and she expressed uh, an in uh, increased inspiration. And she says that the course has made me more confident. I see only possibilities now. So her, her mindset has changed, she expresses this in, the, in this interview. And it's really inspired her to, to think new. And she had this business uh, innovation. Now, she, what, what she was doing was uh, buying water and uh, reselling it uh, to the local community with a tank. Uh, but what she did, inspired from this course, was to buy a hose so that you could supply water from this tank directly to the apartment, to the houses in the vicinity of this tank. I bought a hose and can now supply water to people's houses directly from my water tank. And this created new business opportunities for her because the water would come to the customer rather than the customer coming to the water and then carrying the water to their house, which is heavy. And, and she also she talked about how she had informed her business associates about what she had learned. And she talked about her friend Paolo. I discussed business with my friend Paolo, who runs a cafe. I've given him many specific advice on how to improve his business, to expand his menu, to keep his cafe clean and attractive for customers, etc. His business has improved as a result. So this is about uh, externalities from the course, uh, knowledge spreading to, uh, to business associates which is something that uh, Lars Sivar, uh, in particular, will study in this project. Okay, so uh, we're concerned, of course, about, you know, with, with uh, how this business training will impact profits, uh, employment, and so on. Uh, and we will see what, you know, in, in the summer, which is ahead of us, we will collect data to see what the effect has been, the short-term effect has been on, on these dimensions. But we are interested in, as I said, in the, in the mechanisms. What are the mechanics of, of success? How has it impacted the mindset of, uh, of clients? And for this purpose, we, we carried out a lab uh, where basically we, we asked questions and asked, asked them to, to perform certain tasks uh, incentivized by money. We invited 211 uh, microfinance entrepreneurs from our sample to this lab, 150 females and 71 males, which is approximately the proportion of female and male in, in microfinance in, in the pride system in, in our sample. 
106, so it's like a, a balance, uh, 106 treated and 105 from the control group. Um, and this is how the lab looks. <laughs> they sit at their desks and uh, answer questions. Um, and I will tell you about what the questions that they, the, and tasks they perform. But what the, the key questions that we want to know something about is, you know, uh, have they actually learned anything from this course? It's like an exam, you know? Have they learned, have they picked up anything? How do they perform on business questions? Second, has training changed their mindset? And we're concerned with attitude to risk, time preference, and willingness to compete. Dimensions which we think are important for, for maybe important for business growth, for graduation, for employment creation, and so on. Um, and it, it, moreover, we're interested in, in within group heterogeneity uh, on, on the IQ, on the sort of general ability to, uh, to solve problems dimension, which may have something which may have been important for the absorptive capacity of, of clients of the training which has been going on in, in the classroom. Because, you know, mind you, the, these, while they're almost all illiterate, for sure they have not been <laughs> at school, for, to, at school uh, to school for a long time. And, um, and their ability to, to absorb uh, teaching, although the teaching, of course, was targeted to their kind of their levels, it might be quite, quite challenging. So we're interested in IQ and particular to then IQ as a measure of absorptive capacity, the, the ability to absorb the training. And gender. Um, are women and men different? Do they have different uh, um, attitudes to risk, for instance? And has training affected men and females, men and women, differently? Right. The structure of the lab is as follows. We first ask them gen some questions about general topics, non-business topics, you know, places in Dar es Salaam and Tanzania, uh, questions about uh, sports, and so on. And, uh, we, and they were sitting at their desks, and they were solving these uh, multiple choice questions. And they then got uh, a fixed rate, a small reward for each correct answer, uh, 250 shillings, which is about uh, 0.15 euros. The second task was, uh, well, we asked them, do you want to work for a fixed rate or compete the second time around? You will answer the same kind of questions, uh, and, we, and we want you to, 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 uh, to make a decision whether you want to work for a fixed rate or to compete. Um, we also asked them whether they thought that they were uh, worse, better, or as good as the typical microfinance clients. And indeed, uh, the typical microfinance clients was like a benchmark which, uh, uh, to, on which they were supposed to compete. If they performed better than the typical microfinance client, they could get uh, a high price, 750 T-shillings for each correct answer. If they performed better. If they performed worse, they got nothing. That was the, that's the competition uh, decision. Um, if they worked, chose to work for a fixed rate, it would be like the first round, they would make only 250 T shillings per correct answer. Then uh, we implemented this uh, multiple choice questions again, and they answered the questions, and they had already made a decision whether they were answering the questions uh, based on, on the competitive rate or the fixed rate. And then we asked them questions about um, risk. What are your attitudes uh, to, on risk? And this is how we did it. We presented them uh, sequentially with four different, different gambles. Uh, the first gamble was the following. Well, we said, here's 1,000 shillings. It's your money. You can keep it, or you can, uh, or you can invest it. If you choose to invest it, you, you will um, earn 6,000 shillings uh, with a 50% probability, and zero with an equal probability. Uh, as you can see, 75% uh, of the clients chose this gamble, which is a natural thing given that the, the expected uh, return here is uh, 3,000 and here is only 1,000. So 75% so chose to take this gamble. The second gamble was, well, here's 1,500 shillings. It's your money. You can uh, keep it or you can invest it. Again, investing it will give you 6,000 shillings with 
50% probability and zero with 50% probability. And then we see that the, the, the number of clients who chose to, to gamble was now down to 55%. And so on. The third gamble was 2,000, your money, keep it or gamble. 2,500, keep it or gamble. You can see that the number of people gambling goes down as the, uh, the safe amount goes up, which is, so they clearly understood this experiment. This is a nice picture. She's showing uh, uh, a note saying Bahati, which means uh, lucky. And this is how we, we uh, determined the gamble, whether it was a lucky or an unlucky outcome. It was randomized. And she was in uh, the, the, the people who had then chosen to gamble were then lucky in this case. Now we moved on to, to test their business skills. And we again asked multiple choice questions on, uh, on what are, what's profits, what's good customer care, and so on. And they would work for a fixed rate. And just as with the general topics, they were then invited to, to, to uh, tell us whether they thought they were better at this than the typical microfinance clients, and whether they wanted to work at the, for a fixed rate or to compete uh, the second time around. And they answered that. And then they, as the last point here on this slide, they answered these business skills, uh, multiple choice questions, then either based on a fixed rate or a competitive rate. Finally, we were interested in, in time preferences, and this is how we did that. Everybody who showed up got some money. Of course, they could earn money through their activities, but they were also gu guaranteed a participation fee. But they could choose whether to get the participation fee early or later. Here's what, how we did it. Um, we asked them, do you want to have your participation fee uh, paid one week from now at your Pride branch? Um, by, your, by the pride officer at that, uh, the general manager of that branch. Uh, if you choose to get your, your money paid uh, after one week, we'll give you 15,000 shillings, 8.5 euros. You can choose alternatively to wait uh, three weeks. Um, same procedure, you get the money from the pride, uh, your pride branch, from the pride manager at that branch. Then we will give you 20,000 shillings. Or you can wait five weeks. We'll give you 25,000 shillings. Now, you can see it's, it's quite a steep uh, increase here. Waiting, just waiting four weeks, you'll, you increase from 15,000 to 25,000 shillings. And these are, this is not peanuts. I mean, this is serious money for these people. And um, it's, it's, a sh sharp, it's a sharp uh, interest uh, uh, for waiting. Um, and just note that the yearly interest on pride loans is 30%. And uh, 1,000 shillings, you can buy a decent meal at a local restaurant. So this is serious money for these people. What do we find? Well, uh, almost half of them chose to wait five weeks to get the big, the big uh, reward. But quite a few <laughs> chose to uh, wait uh, one week only and to get the 15,000 after only one week. And some also chose the intermediate position of, of three weeks. But this is saying nothing about treatment, the treatment effects so far. This is just uh, giving you the, the, the overall picture. Just to see whether treatment and control groups are equal on, uh, on the observables, the answer is yes. Uh, the, the treatment and control group perform equally well on math questions, and they're equally scaled on general questions. So the, the, they seem, the groups seem to be very comparable on observables, as, as they should be given the randomization procedure. We are interested, as I said, in business skills. We're interested in, in time preference, attitude to risk, and to competitiveness. What do we find? Have they learned anything from this course? The answer is yes. The treated group has, on average, a 10% better performance on business questions. And indeed, the treated people who showed up at all the lectures, which was quite a few, they had a 20% better score on um, on business questions, controlling for, for IQ. Let me, let me just say we, we control, IQ is measured how well, by how well they answer math questions. So yes, they, 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 ha, they have picked up something from the course in terms of business skills. Um, and uh, in particular, we can see that uh, the effect has been strong for, 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 for uh, women. So the, in general, Women know less about business, uh, have few, less business skills than, than men, but the, the training has lifted, uh, this, is, uh, this is treated female, these are controlled female, so 
So the, the, the training has lifted the business skills for, for women in particular. Um, the effect has not been so pronounced for men. Uh, I have some, um, it's, it's um, maybe because the, the, the uh, prior skills of men was already quite high before the training. So to increase the, the level of, of business skills from an already high level might be more challenging. This is one, this is sort of one example of a question we ask, a multiple choice question on business. Which of the following is, an important, is important when you plan the daily tasks in your business? You know, check A for remember to include family tasks, which is a wrong answer. B, make clear who is responsible for each task, which is the correct answer. C, don't plan for more tasks than you can carry it yourself. Incorrect. Leave as many tasks as possible for your workers, which is also incorrect. And you see, while yes, true, also the control group answered, you know, had a majority on the correct answer, uh, the, the treated group had clearly more, <laughs> um, more of the treated group had answered correctly on this question. So, you know, almost 20% of the control group said that we should always remember to include family tasks when, when planning the daily task of your business. And the separation of family and business is a major issue in, in, the, in this course and in, in business in general. What about uh, willingness to gamble? Well, this is the, you know, remember the four gambles? Uh, one, two, three, four. It, here's, here's, uh, here's 1,000, you can, it's your money, you can keep it or gamble, gamble it. And you don't see much of a difference on average, but this uh, average, uh, seemingly no effect, uh, disguises an interesting gender effect. Because in particular, uh, males have become uh, much less willing to, to get, take a gamble. Treated males have become much more risk averse. So what we see is that uh, the majority of treated males stop gambling after this investment too. They will be willing to gamble with 1,500 shillings, but when it comes to 2,000 shillings for sure, no, we'll stop there. The majority of control males stop gambling only after investment three. So they will, they're more inclined to gamble. The, 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 con the control males are more inclined to gamble. So, so, so risk aversion has increased uh, among males. Uh, females seem to become more risk willing. So while, uh, so in, in the control group, group, the majority of females stop gambling after invest this uh, gamble number one. They would, the, the control female would say no to a gamble of 1500 with certainty versus 6000 and zero. But the, the treated females stop gambling only after investment too. So the treated females and the males are, have become more similar. So the a converse, conversion, uh, convergence of, of uh, attitude to risk between males and females because of this risk, because of this training, sorry. Um, what about time preference? Another important dimension. What do we find? And remember, we, they could choose between waiting for a long time to get their participation fee or get it soon, but a smaller amount. We see that uh, if you look at the, the five weeks, yes, there's a much bigger share of the treated clients choose to wait five weeks rather than get the, a smaller amount paid out quickly. So this seems to have a, had a significant effect on, on time preference. Um, I'll skip the gender dimension there. Finally, uh, willingness to compete. You remember they were asked, do you want to compete on this topic next time around or not? And they could get the high reward if they chose to compete, and they will get a small reward uh, if they chose to, uh, to um, work for the fixed rate. But of course, competition involves some risk. Apparently, no effect at all. So they, on average, the control group and the treat group are equally eager to compete, or uh, not eager to compete. Does that mean that, uh, that we have no treatment effect on competition at all? Not, not necessarily. Uh, the decision to compete is quite a complex uh, decision. It involves, you know, should I compete or not? Well, how much do I know about this topic? Uh, how confident am I uh, on my skills relative to the skills of others? Because I'm competing against some kind of benchmark, some kind of typical microcredit uh, micro uh, entrepreneur. What's my attitude to risk? Important. What's my attitude to competing? 
there's a, there's a literature out there on aversion to competing as such. So, and you can imagine that the, the training can have an impact on, on several of these dimensions. On confidence, on attitude to risk, and on attitude to competing. And it's unclear what we should sort of ex ante expect the treatment effect to be. Just to give you, I'll finish in one minute, if that's okay. Just to, to give you one, uh, one indication of why we could have a treatment effect, even if uh, it's sort of apparently there is, no, there is none. Remember that males have become significantly more risk averse. Right? That, that's been established in this, uh, this lab. Yet they, com they, they, they do not compete less than the males in the control group. So maybe the treatment effect is, is sort of uh, quite complex. <laughs> that it has made men less uh, risk willing, more risk averse, which pulls in the direction of I want to compete less. Yet it has made them more willing to engage in competition, which is positive. So the two forces sort of balance each other, which apparently then gives a zero effect. So there could, be a, there could be a strong treatment effect, but with the effects pulling in different directions. But we have to work more on, on the, we, we, it's the complex decision, we have to work more on this. So just to conclude, um, we have found in the lab, uh, which we, uh, we were trying to explore the effect of the training on the mindset of entrepreneurs, that Business training, yes, has increased the business skills of, uh, of, the, of the participants in this training, particularly the women. Um, it seems that absorptive capacity matters in the terms that, that your IQ score, measured as your performance on the math questions, matter. And it, we have had a convergence in the business skills of women to the, those of men. Um, you should go quickly through the rest. This is the last slide. Business training has led to a convergence on attitudes of risk between the genders. So reduce the risk aversion of women and increase the risk aversion of men. It has had a positive impact on the willingness to wait. Strong effect for women. So while control females, so females in the control group are less patient than men, females in the treatment group are more patient than men. Finally, business co training and competition, well, the jury is still out. Uh, apparently no effect, but that can, uh, as I said, uh, sort of hide a quite complex effect on a quite complex decision. So we're still working on how to understand the treatment effect on the willingness to compete. And that's, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Comments, questions? Yes. Two. Uh, one is I, I would like to know, um, in your, your lab part, you of course had selected 210 people, but some of these have received a grant from you as well. Not and how would that mm -hmm. affect your results? Okay. Not, not prior to the lab. Oh, that was that, After that the lab. Was yes. mm -hmm. And then I was wondering, any potential spillover effects you might suspect between the groups who meet on Mondays and the group who meet on Tuesdays or Wednesdays and Thursdays for that matter because they are probably part of the same regions and how could that affect your results? Okay. So just to answer one, let me just answer that one. Uh, okay. That's okay. So yes, spillovers is, is an important uh, issue and as I said, um, Lars Ivar who's sitting just in front of you, he's, he's going to research that uh, with a white shirt there. He's, go he's going to research that in particular. Um, there might be some spillover effects. We don't believe that the spillover effects are very big. Uh, Dar es Salaam is a big city and, and uh, it's the, the, I think the people mainly meet at the, the business, uh, at the loan meetings and then sort of spread out. But uh, indeed we will, uh, we will try to, to look at spillovers seriously. Yes. Um, yes, I've got a question about the um, uh, training that you did. 
particularly with the risk preference. Um, so what you find is that um, if they had a training, that their risk, they're less, they're, they're getting more risk averse actually, right? The men. Yeah, the male. But I was wondering, is that something that we really want if you consider that entrepreneurs usually would want to take some risk to actually stand out and and um, actually maintain something and you know get something out of it. Um, so you would need you would actually need something um, that makes you better than your neighbor who does not take the risk because you are the entrepreneur, right? Um, and then I was wondering, so now you're only uh, measuring the effect of your program um, based on questionnaires or questions at least. Are you in the future, since you're having this very fantastic design that you're actually gonna do another survey this year and then coming back to the next year, are you also gonna relate that to some more objective outcome variables? Like, are they actually doing better? Not only that they understood their training apparently, but are they doing better in business? Um, yeah, uh, of course, uh, whether less, you know, whether reducing uh, risky behavior is good or bad, well, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. Um, it's clearly, it's, it's, all, it's not always good to gamble. You know. Some, no, I think the, what, the yeah. Pardon me? Your expected value in the gamble was always higher than what you could take the short run. Well, the, yes, but you know, with some risk aversion, uh, with some, they should, it's, not, it's not necessarily true that they should gamble with 2,500 shillings when the expected return is 3,000. But, uh, but what, they, uh, what they're taught in this course is to, to take calculated risks. You know, you, you, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you should, <laughs> sometimes you should engage in risky behavior, but you, you know, you know, do your homework first. You know, check out the market and uh, and uh, what are your cap you know plan, make a plan. And uh, I think there there are some there are some studies out there showing that uh, you know men are much more risk seeking than women, and not always for the good. Uh, I can I'm sure there will be lots of examples uh, of uh, uh, investments failing simply because they. They just jumped into a project without really thinking about uh, uh, planning, planning for it well, and uh, the project would therefore fail. Um, but, uh, but whether it's good or bad, I don't know. This is just what the, what, uh, what the, uh, what the, the data show. On the uh, measuring the real effects, of course, we will, we will collect data from the questionnaires. So it will be self-reported data on, on profits. Of course, it's very difficult to, uh, to uh, measure this, measure profits, but we, we have we're working, we have been working quite hard to find good, in, good, uh, um, good questions to capture profits and, and business activity. But we, will, we also rely on, on bank data. You know? uh, have they, how much do they save, do they save in, in, the, in this uh, microfinance institution? Do they, have they had any payment problems in the, in the micro? Have they, have they taken up higher loans? And to take a higher loan, you have to get the acceptance of the group, which is an indication of success. So we do have some hard facts from the bank. In addition, we do collect uh, data through the questionnaires, and uh, then I think we'll get a pretty good picture of um, whether they have indeed graduated as a, re as a result of the, of the training or, or not. Thank you. I'm afraid our time is up. Hmm? So hmm. thank you again. <laughs> and let me, and let me in the end, thank the three speakers and all the people who have spoken up during this session, which I think has been exceptionally good. Three very, very good papers on important and uh, very timely issues. So, thank you. Yeah.